We have a high level of need. We have plenty of available public land, good quality public land. We have low cost finance and enormous expertise in our local authorities, in the department, in the housing agency, in the housing finance agency. The key is how you put those groups of people together to deliver. Sure, we can have private builders, but not the private sector driving it. So surely we can have mixed tenure local authority estates where local authorities provide the land, uh, they set out the broad parameters on the basis of what's needed. They can be mixed tenure, they can have some private and some cost rental and social. Uh, uh, they can be funded through, as we heard the NTMA tell us uh, in the affirmative uh, on Tuesday, uh, off balance sheet through a NARPS type vehicle if possible or through 100% exchequer funding if possible. But do it in that way. So for example, in the Grange site, and Pro Billy, I have his head twisted on this, South Dublin County Council has 44 acres of land. We could have a mixed tenure local authority housing estate of 800 units there with spaces for schools and community facilities, etc. And it could be delivered by a competent local authority through a NARPS type vehicle uh, and whoever else. What are we going to get instead under the existing strategy of government? We're going to get 100 houses on that in five years' time. So I just think, you know, without wanting to be, be, be awkward about it, if we continue down the same failed strategy that has got us into this mess, things aren't going to change. So I'm just asking, can we not start to look at mixed tenure, local authority or approved housing body led estates on a large scale with the funding that we're being told by the NTMA and Department of Finance officials only a few days ago that is there. And if we started to insert that into social housing strategy, we could look at producing much larger numbers of units, greater levels of income mix, uh, and we could seriously start to tackle uh, the social housing waiting lists. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. And there's one brief further comment. Do you want uh, Deputy Brophy at this stage? Or? Well, the reason I'd like to make it to this stage is because yeah. it directly links to the, the, the two previous contributions. Okay, yeah, no, and rather ahead. than have people answer and then have yeah, no. anything. I, 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 and I also was listening to what Deputy Coppinger said uh, to the Minister earlier on. And I mean, I, I think there's probably almost total agreement on this. It, in the two contributions which we, we heard, and thank you very much for making them to us, the, I mean, the sustainable, the, the 10% words which I'd have a real problem with, you know, the, the ghetto I think was used at one stage and whatever. There is a situation, I believe, which is this. What we built in the past failed the people we built it for. Not because it was a mono-tenement uh, development or whatever, but because we built sprawling developments on the edge of cities and then singularly failed to provide anything at all in terms of a proper development, uh, in terms of schools and churches, and in terms of transport, in terms of all the various things, shops, the most basic, basic things that communities needed. We seem to be then using that now as an absolute mantra to try and stop any new thinking in terms of building and myself and Deputy Coventry maybe don't agree on a lot of things, but I, I was totally caught by her contribution earlier on, and um, Owen echoed it there, in terms of if we want to solve this, I mean, at 10%, you'd have to be building 350,000 houses to get your 10% 35,000. That just doesn't. I mean, there's not a person here who can sit here, I believe, and tell us that that makes sense, that that's credible, because it isn't. And I challenge my own minister, if he was still here, or anybody else, to explain that to me. Because I believe that there needs to be a very major change, and I hope that's what this committee will lead to. But those to echo the points and the questions raised by own, and we, we both know Billy very well on this, there's incredible, well-led systems that have been done by local authorities in the past. There's incredibly competent people in the sector. But there needs to be a change and a break on that. And there also needs to be, which is the other point I wanted to echo, there needs to be something between the two years that even at four stages and everything else, that it just forever takes. It's like as if you don't trust each other to deliver a project. And I can't see how that makes sense, that there needs to be checking back four or five times to get basic projects over the line. That has to be changed. And there has to be a simple solution. Chair, Thank you. Can I ask on that as well? Well, I was going and to let you in. Focus on well, do, do, you want, do you want to reply to that and then come back in? It's just on this issue because it's, it's very disheartening to hear local authority managers coming in and basically arguing against social housing on the scale that's needed. Well, that's the way it can be interpreted. Now, I know some of you personally have had dealings with you. I, I, I don't believe that is your... But it's like you've absorbed this philosophy that's coming. Because there's been 300... And, uh, 90,000 local authority houses built in the last century in this country. 
And it just seems to me there's actually quite a low level of social problems, actually. Like, people keep throwing out a handful of estates. Like, Ballymun has been recited here on several occasions. Um, and I totally agree that the, the social problems did occur, mainly because isolation, far flung, lack of facilities. When I moved out to Blanchardstown, you couldn't buy a pair of socks in the area, you know, until the town centre was built, which took 20 years after the houses went in. But this is actually a real problem because if you, let's say there's 100,000 on the social housing list, apparently it was claimed yesterday there's 140,000, let's go with 100,000. You'd need to build a million houses then to get rid of the social housing list. So what level of social housing is acceptable to, I'm talking about the department as well as the, 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 the managers. There was a, a motion put on Dublin City Council on Friday or Monday by Fianna Fáil, for example, that there be a third only of social housing for anything over 40 houses. The immediate suggestion is anything over 40 council houses is a major social problem. Like, we'd have to build 3,000 estates then to sort out the social housing list. This isn't doable. Now, the international research that you cite, I believe, I'd like to hear a bit more, because I believe the problem isn't mono-tenure, it's mono-income. And who took that decision? To introduce tenant purchase, right, and to introduce that grant that I remember well, the 5,000 grant, I think it was Fine Gael, I'm not sure, but it was a, a grant that every worker who had a good income moved out of the estate and sold their house. That turned the, social, the council houses into mono-income and it destroyed loads of communities. That was the problem. I believe we have to reconfigure public housing. I don't really like the term social housing, I prefer council housing or public housing, but also have a diversity of incomes living there. You know, but if people think we're going to solve the social housing problem by building 30 houses here and 20 there, you can forget it. Because the only way housing crises were resolved in the 70s and 30s was building large scale. And you'd have economies of scale, by the way, which is really important to the cost. You know, you'd be, which you have to do, you've had the housing agency in. But also, I think direct build is very important. Like the, there was four stages men mentioned by the department. Two of those stages are to do a tendering. How much time does that add on to the time scale that's needed? If you had, like, and I know it's dreadfully old-fashioned, but if you had direct build, local authority workers, you would cut out that whole tendering process, you know, and the pre-tendering process as well. But it's just this kind of stigmatising of, of, of the states. The word underclass was used earlier. I'm sure it was a, a mistake on, on, on your part. No, but it's, it's people, it's, it's it's people a, well, it's a very work. dangerous thing to be saying well, that people are an it's underclass if they can't get a house. People who are not treated house. properly. That's what I mean. Okay. The, uh, people that are not treated properly and they were not okay. respected. That's what I'm talking about. Can I just about. raise one other thing? And this is something that <clears throat> Mr. Brady might want to comment on. I, I live in a, a mixed tenure estate. I don't know if other people do, but there was 200 private. 400 affordable mortgage and 104 council tenants, right? I think it's, it works very well, actually, but my problem would be if we introduce affordable mortgages, which I'm in favour of because people do have an issue about wanting to buy their house. Most of those houses now, and I think uh, Mr Brady or whoever's in Fingal will back, now will back me up on this, most of the people who bought the affordable mortgages have sold those houses and now they're privately rented. There's hardly any of us original residents now. And actually, we should look at introducing a rule that if people want to have an affordable more, maybe to consider they must sell it back to the council or something. Because actually what's happening is that they're just selling it on and people are... The private rented sector is a bigger social problem, actually, than council tenants. But I, I do have a question for Fingal later, okay. if I could. But it's thank, just that thank you, Deputy. Look, a, a whole range of questions have been have been ranged. Uh, some of them are general uh, in relationship to the whole procurement process between the department and local authorities. Uh, some of them were specific. So I don't know if the department or the uh, individual local Dublin local authorities would like to address the department first. Then, uh, 
if, uh, tick, tick. Sorry, if I may, um, yes. a, a couple of things that I, that I might take for the department, and um, in, in a minute I might ask my colleague um, Sarah Neary to talk about the, um, the approval process and why we have different roles for local authorities and, and, and for uh, the department, I think, which, which uh, Deputy O'Brien raised. Um, Deputy O'Dowd talked about the lack of, of local authority build and, and uh, that local authorities um, no longer had the skills. Uh, essentially, um, the background to where we are now is that, uh, as you said, there, has been ver there had been very little um, uh, construction happening in the, in, in the local authority sector for, for quite a number of years at the time that we launched the social housing strategy. So the past 18 months, have, we have been working very intensively on building capacity back up again, on strengthening governance, on streamlining our systems and our procedures, and making sure that we put the right people and the right resources in place to deal with the uh, vastly increased uh, workload that, that we have. And um, as I said earlier, we now have the resources to, to uh, enable us to uh, fa go and visit uh, local authorities, work through the proposals with them, and uh, enable us to get pe uh, projects through the approval process um, in a much more timely fashion. Um, we have seen a, a, a noticeable um, pickup in the throughput of projects through the approval process. Just because there's four stages doesn't mean that it has to take a very long time. Some of those stages can be quite short, uh, depending on where the project is at, and I'll let, I'll let Sarah talk a, a bit more about that. Um, Deputy O'Dowd also mentioned the uh, issue which also came up with the Minister this morning about the percentages of the housing waiting list that will be uh, tackled by the various um, uh, capital projects uh, that have been approved for 2015 to 17. Um, we have said from the outset to local authorities that we would be monitoring the spend on um, capital projects and reviewing it on an ongoing basis. So where, for example, in some cases projects are not being, proce not being proceeded with, we can, we can move the funding to other projects and so on. So um, what I would say to you is the targets that we set for 2015 to 17 was our first phase. Uh, the total number of units um, was 22,000. 882 units approved are um, indicated by way of a target with 1.5 billion, as the minister said, and the national average was 25% of the waiting list. So um, we would imagine, and, and as the minister said, he, his ambition is to, to, to do more. So this would be a first, a first step. Um, another thing. This, uh, the housing demand doesn't increase over that period. It's assuming that the level of demand stays static at. 2014. Well, um, and we know that's not the case. Well, on the on the question of the waiting list, a couple of thing, points I'd like to make there. Firstly, would be that the figures we have at the moment and the ones that we based these these targets on are from the housing need assessment of 2013, which had I think 89,000 or so on the list. So, um, under the social housing strategy, we have a commitment to do a new housing need assessment this year, and that process is now underway. And we will have a comparable figure, whatever that is for 2016 um, by the end of this year. The second thing to say, however, is that we already know that um, about 50% of those 89,000 were in the, in the already um, in housing paid for by the state in terms of rent supplement. That's the first point. The second point then is that um, what we have found, uh, for example, with the experience of choice-based letting in Cork is that some of the people who are on the social housing list um, are not actively seeking a social housing unit. So we would be, we would have as one of our objectives to encourage local authorities to um, adopt choice-based letting so that we can get a, a more real figure for the actual social housing need, the net need. So there's a number of different things we want to do to, um, to, to get a, a more accurate figure on, on what the actual waiting lists are. Um, before I pass over to Sarah, just one other thing as well, um, and it was to do, uh, it's to do with the, um, the points being made about, well, if we only have sustainable communities in part five, we'll never meet the, meet the need. It's, we need to bear in mind that the social housing strategy is not just about local authority build. 
What we are talking about today and what most of the interest is in is in construction by local authorities. But the, uh, the social housing strategy has multiple strands um, and we have approved housing body bills as well, for example. Um, approved housing bodies can build under the capital assistance scheme but they can also get a capital advance leasing facility and raise funding um, from the private sector and therefore they're, they're, that's off balance sheet which goes to another issue we were talking talking about. Crucially as well, approved housing bodies can do mixed tenure developments, and some of them already have done so. So they can have a mix of, 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 of affordable and, and, um, and, and private. And then the private rented sector, it is a pillar of the social housing strategy to develop and to provide 75,000 additional uh, 75,000 units through the private rented sector. And that is why it's crucial for us that the private rental sector uh, would come on stream. Just finally, I'd mention that we also are looking actively at an affordable rental scheme, which the Minister will be bringing forward to government very shortly, to provide for that cohort of the population who are on low incomes but don't qualify for social housing, so that there's something there for them. So, uh, if I may, yeah? Please. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so I suppose on the approval process, uh, I, I might just start off with, exp with um, describing all construction projects follow the same sort of format and the same stages. You've got your concept, uh, then preparing and going through the planning process, then there's the detailed design, so the tendering process, the tendering assessment, and then eventually getting on site and uh, boots on the ground. That process is followed by all local authority social housing projects as well. The approval process with the department knits into those stages in a, in a, uh, just at key points. And the process has been reduced from the, the nine-stage process under the Capital Works Management Framework to a four-stage process that we agreed with the um, CCMA to work as effectively and as um, efficiently as possible, reflecting the normal process for, for construction projects. Um, so maybe going back to the framework of, of uh, construction projects what, where the department um, have approval uh, stages is after the capital appraisal. So the local authority prepare a capital appraisal. It establishes the need, um, the particulars of the project, the number of units, the type of units, uh, how it integrates with the local community, the cost, the program and the delivery mechanism. Then the, the department uh, review that. Uh, review the need, optimisation of land, the integration into the community from the point of view of the Sustainable Communities Programme, uh, the suitability of the uh, site and the accommodation to match that need. And I suppose the, the value of this separate from the, the requirements under the Capital Works Framework, the cost certainty, value for money and accountability side, the value of this is that it adds a national consistency to both standards, the housing themselves and the, uh, the, the, the cost perspective, so it gives a national uh, perspective. The second stage then is when there is more detail on the project uh, in, in, prep, in preparing to go to planning and that's both uh, a design a design overview and, uh, and a cost review as well. Then the project goes through the planning process, generally part eight, and a detailed design process. They take time um, and they're, they're with the local authority. Then there's a pre-tendering a cost assessment only. We don't go back reviewing designs. It's purely a cost at that stage, and that's a relatively quick process. And then when the then the tendering process happens, after that a tender assessment, and again reviewed by the department, um, purely on a cost basis, and and the project uh, continues to site. Th this is a normal enough process for construction projects. Can, do you mind if I ask you? And sorry for interrupting, colleagues. Could you put a time frame on that process for us? A typical. I'm, I'm sorry, no, but I, I'm not. I'm not in any way critical of the steps. But okay. you, you've told us a process, and I suppose we're all listening to project to, to people explaining the difficulty in the the process. So, what would that take in time? Or and I know that this is a new system. So the other question is the old nine-step process. How long was it taking? So where are we in time? Okay, so I mean, I suppose just to put it in perspective, we're talking about hundreds of projects, some big, some small, some apartments, some houses, some very, very um, small, very distinct, very easy to predict time. 
and then there, it's much more complex. Oh, this. Uh, There's a whole committee I, waiting I for this answer. <laughs> I don't think you can put uh, a set period of time for a typical construction project because they're not typical. Everyone has their own character. But I would say that you could give an average. I, I would say on average eighteen to two eighteen months to two years for that process. And sorry, Chairperson, you said you weren't critical of the process. I go back to my point. I'm highly critical of that process. I'm really sorry. As I said to you, it's like as if you don't seem to trust each other. If if the department seems to second guess every stage what I presume another arm of the government, which is local government, is doing, it's like as if the department thinks, my God, I'm, I'm only going to use it because it's my own former council that South Dublin County Council has done this project, it must have done all of that assessment itself, we'll do it all a second time. And then we'll do the cost assessment a second time and think, to my mind, I'm sorry, that process makes absolutely no sense to me. At all. Thank you, Deputy. Mr. Cummins, did you want to comment on this piece as well? Well, no, I, I, I come in after. Okay, uh, yeah. sorry, sorry, yeah. Ms. Neary. Um, so I suppose the, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, there's the capital management framework process. It's about cost certainty, it's about value for money. It's also about accountability for exchequer funding, as Barbara said. Um, no, Parishes so don't do that, sorry. So, well, it, it's exchequer funding from, from the from the department, 100% exchequer funding. But uh, and sorry, do you believe the local authorities don't have any checks on how it's spent? That they that you need to double check everything because they don't have any checks. I, I suppose the point I would make is that the detail work is done at the local authority level, and that takes a significant period of time. The uh, approval process is only looking at that in a short space of time and at a high level and making uh, making points of national uh, at a national level it's knowledge sharing it's providing consistency across the country in terms of the housing the standards applied to it and the cost uh, the costs around it and value for money yes uh, if i could just clarify as well um, I, I, th I would imagine that some of the commentary that is coming about the delays in the process uh, are a reflection of where we were uh, about 18 months ago. As I've described, we have spent the last 18 months strengthening our capacity, recruiting additional resources, streamlining processes, so as to enable the, the whole process to, to go much more smoothly and much quicker. So, um, I, and, and the Minister has already said as well that he is, is determined to improve it further, and we are already doing that. I would have to say, from my perspective, I've seen a significant uh, increase or improvement in the throughput times through the various stages in the last six months. That is partly because in the first three months of this year, we held nine seminars and workshops around the country where our professionals, our QS and our architects, um, went and visited uh, local authority staff and approved housing body staff and explained to them the procedures and explained to them what was required for each approval stage. For example, if a local authority have new staff who haven't worked in housing before, they send something in for a stage two and it doesn't have the right documentation, then that causes a delay. So we have taken the approach that communication is at the heart of this, joint working, collaborative working with the local authorities. And we've been focusing on that between January and March. We had nine workshops and seminars. Since March, our teams have met with every, virtually every local authority and we have meetings arranged for June and July as well. So I would be fairly confident that you will see a significant upturn in the degree, the length of time it takes for the, for the uh, projects to go through those various stages. Yes, the NBA yeah. used to deal with that, say, for the local council. I sat on the National Building Agency, design, build, the whole lot, one-stop shop. They got the contract, they delivered. Why don't you do that? In other words, why have all this other stuff going on? Well, the process at the moment is that it's the local authorities no, have the responsibility I, I for assessing that, the housing not, need and I, so I accept on. that's what's yeah. happened. But what's wrong with the NBA doing all of that? They did it very efficiently, very quickly, very professionally. The local authority essentially rubber stamped. They got yeah. the land and that was it. 
<laughs> the, the NBA as it was then yeah. is was incorporated into the housing agency and it has a has, well, it, it has a different this, role and the capacity again its capacity its its staffing yeah. and so on but okay. the same objective can be achieved through the department and the local authorities working proactively together in my view chairman just you know just one second because i think mr Cummins wants to get in on this point and to yeah. be fair uh, Chairman, I, I think it's, 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 it's important to highlight that yeah. the scale of the problem that we have is, is, is enormous. And the, the problem, the shortage of housing in the country, um, there is a huge issue, as we all know. I don't have to tell anyone that. So at a time when the NBA were assisting in, in, in the past, it was a different scenario. It was a different scale. It was a different society. The private sector were engaged. Uh, local authorities were building, had been building for decades. Um, the problem didn't exist to the same scale, and you know I think it's very important for for me to, for, for me to say on behalf of the local government that um, we are in the business of providing social housing for those who are not in a position to do so out of their own um, resources. And I wouldn't like you know anyone to think that um, in terms of our comments in relation to the private sector that there's any attempt to transfer ownership of providing social housing to the private sector when clearly it is our uh, a significant our problem in terms of meeting the needs of those who can't meet their own but the main point is that without the private sector who will build houses and free up units as it is in the past for those who are able to buy houses if they were built and affordable and to free up houses into the private rental circle cir uh, private rented sector and also to allow HAP houses and rent supplement and leasing and all that has happened in the past. And I think it's very important, Chairman, to point out that we managed this issue in the past when we were building estates, but the scale of the problem that exists at the moment is outside of the, it's outside of the capacity. I know, I'm, I'm sorry, Chair. I know, but I, I, I unfortunately have to go over there as well. There, there, there is no, no doubt about it, Chairman, that the fact that local authorities haven't been building social housing for quite some time is adding to the problem. But so is the fact that the economy has improved, people are coming back into the country, finding jobs, and displacing those who heretofore were able to rent in the private sector, they are now looking for the, at, at competing with the same properties. The population has increased, and there's the absence of the private sector. And we, we, we as a sector, have to emphasise this. It's in no way to relieve us from our duties, but we need to partner with the private sector and everyone else to provide the level of housing uh, to assist us in meeting our challenges. And as Barbara McEngus has pointed out, it's not just about building, it's about leasing, it's about uh, the, uh, the private sector. Um, it's all clearly set out in the social housing strategy. And, uh, Chairman, can I as well, while, while I have the floor, speak about the, the percentage, the 10%? Can, can I make it very clear that um, the state has in its ownership large tracts of land? And we're not saying that every piece of land, that only 10% can, can be used for social housing. It depends on where it is. For instance, there could be a, a fairly sizable site in the middle of Dublin City that could be fully built out for social units because overall, in the overall context of the city or the area around that particular site, um, there is the mixed tenure there already. However, in, in a smaller town, uh, building out a complete site for social housing um, would lead to the problems that we're all familiar with. So I just want to make that point that it's not 10% full stop. And also as well, um, Chairman, it doesn't matter whether it's the, the, the approved housing bodies or the local authorities. We are not, we are in the business of providing social housing. We are not in the business of providing shops, hotels, restaurants, uh, churches. You know, we need the involvement of the private sector, and it did work in the past. Okay, lessons to be learned in relation to credit and all of that, but it did work in the past, and it proved to be a very effective solution to meeting the needs of. Uh, of, of Irish society. And Sorry, what do you mean worked in the past? We, we didn't have this enormous problem in the past. Well, you're saying the private sector not being involved no, is the no, problem, rather I, I'm than saying the we local didn't authorities have, not being involved. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, we're just trying to clarify. No, no the point I'm, I'm making, that this is a problem, um, so be, it, this problem hasn't happened in the history of the state before. 
and it's for many reasons, we all know what they are, and heretofore, and when we didn't have the problem, the private sector were fully engaged, they were working with local authorities, they were playing their development, development contributions. Sorry about this, then. I know, I know, but I, 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 unfortunately I have to go and share the, share I the house. De but I, I, I want to say this, I want to say this no, before, before please, I leave. Please allow, please can I just, allow say, can I just say this, Chairman, before I leave? I disagree entirely. The failure of the system goes back at least 10, 15 years, when responsibility was transferred away from the local authorities for carrying the burden of local authority housing. And as long as that policy continues in the Department of the Environment, we will never resolve the problem. And I don't want to go into the situation whereby people who didn't qualify for a local authority house because their income was too high and didn't qualify for a local authority loan because the income, their income was too low and ask people who were the, 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 on my constituents and the constituents of my colleagues here as well and ask them what they thought about the system that operated then. So I, I, I'm sorry, to, to Chairman, I'm not going to delay the meeting Thank and you. I know that I'm barging in and barging out again, but the fact of the matter is this, I fundamentally disagree with the assessment that's put forward. I was watching it from the screen over at the other side of the House. And until such time as there's a major departure from the Department's policy in relation to reliance on the local authorities or private housing bodies or the private sector, and don't forget this, the Department of Social Welfare, for a number of years, carried the responsibility of the Department of the Environment in relation to local authority houses and shouldn't have. And it, wasn't, it, it was never the desired policy of anybody. And certainly we were never consulted about it. And the last point on that one, Chairman, is, is simply this. It was only a temporary thing. It was only supposed to be temporary. And it went on forever to replace the local authorities through the Department of Social Welfare. And I, all I can appeal to you, Chairman, again is this. Please don't allow us to continue on down that road, because that is not going to solve our housing problem. And there are, whatever it is, 2,000 families uh, homeless around this city at the present time. There are others all over the country. And the more repetition we go through with this, talking about all the obstacles that, that affect the problem, we know what they are. And I believe that I know what they are, and I know that you believe, Chairman, that you know what they are as well. Please, could we not focus on them? Yeah. And I'm sorry about don't, that. Don't move for one moment, Deputy. I just want to clarify one point. Uh, it's not we or them. This committee collectively over the next two weeks will make our recommendations. So, there, you know, we, we will be formulating a report based on the evidence. That's the purpose of the witnesses today. You don't have to ask me what to do. We collectively as a committee will make our recommendations. Okay. And I'm not saying you, you, you will make your own mind up in due course based on the evidence you've heard, what those recommendations might be. Mr Cummins, uh, yeah, just, just I, I, just, I just want to, be, be, before, before you go, no, bear with me one moment, because a number of members have raised questions. The Department have had an opportunity to issue, as a, uh, to respond to some of them, and Mr Cummins is in possession at the moment. But I would also like the four local, Dublin local authorities represented here to respond to, that, to the issues as they see yes. it as well. So just give, two small give that opportunity, yeah. please. Just a question, then, because yeah. it's only oh, well, actually, there was deputy. Yeah. You're the last. I just need to come in whenever you call me, just on one it's point. Deputy I think, O'Sullivan I think this is really unfair yeah. because yeah. you know, Deputy Durkin came in and we didn't get the chance over here. Deputy Was had to go. Oh, I, I feel like walking out as well. No, because take, we're you not... work away, Deputy. Okay, thank you very much. I'm trying to get a sense of how quickly between everybody we can see a major difference when it comes to housing and to making a dent in the lists. Now, the Minister earlier told us about some 4,000 or so under construction now, and this is Dublin, and there's planning permission for another 27,000 and another 80,000 could be built on zoned land for which there is planning permission. We're told that the capital is, the, is available. So can we get a time frame or, or what sort of time frames are you working towards that we will see a difference and that we will see um, uh, the, the list going down. That's the first. Second one is how many PAR 5 applications are in at the moment and have we a sense of how quickly they can be moved along. We know also about the need for one to two beds and how can you ensure with private developers that there will be sufficient one to two beds built. Um, to satisfy the need. My other one is about emergency accommodation and it's that no emergency ac hostel accommodation is closed down until there is an alternative because we had that um, recently and when we were in focus point yesterday something we all know but was brought home very clearly the bureaucracy involved in HAP which is preventing people from availing of it.
Thank you, Deputy. Um, I'll go back to Mr. Cummins, but and there were specifically when, in relation to Deputy O'Sullivan, there were a number of very specific questions in relation to Part 5, and I'm not sure whether it will be each local authority respond to, to that or whether the Department has centralised figures on what's going on. M Mr Cummins, do you want to complete? Yeah, just, thank you, Chairman. Just uh, two points, um, <coughs> and, and, and the main point I want to make is in relation to the procedures that are there in procurement, we're, we're very much, we're totally under the control of auditing procedures and the control of all the general, general uh, external auditors, internal auditors, and we have to, uh, we have to justify all decisions we make in terms of financial spend. So the process, it's cumbersome, um, but it's, 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 a, it's a continuous checking and auditing, and uh, we have to justify our, our, our spend. Um, I'm going to ask uh, my Just colleague. You ask, I have two, two, if you don't mind. Deputy O'Dell, is there something brief you it, want to. It is, yeah. No, it's just if I can put it uh, the best way. The National Building Agency, to my absolute knowledge and experience, was very efficient when a lot of houses were being built by them. They did a fantastic job. We never had a complaint. Uh, would you, and that's my personal view. I know it's the housing agency now. Would, what, would you agree? I'm, I'm not trying to trap you into an answer here, but uh, to, to me it seems that a one stop shop with all the experts in the department and the housing agency together on your local authorities, specialists, sit in one office in one building and deal with all these issues. That there's only one review, there's only one cost done. You know, you don't go back, that all of the checks and balances are done. And that's it, because otherwise I feel that you, you lose, we lose, the, the bureaucracy okay. takes over, and that's not being disrespectful to you. I think that's what I would like to see. Thank you, Deputy. Yeah. And while you're answering that, just you raised a point yourself specifically. You said we're subject to, uh, Mr. Cummins, you said we're subject to audit control and so forth. Is it, it just made me think, the local government have a local government auditor, and, your, and the department is subject to the CNAG. Is it an issue that you both have to satisfy two different controllers effectively? And is that adding to the bureaucratic process that you're... Do you understand the question? Um, that, yes. that the local government have a local government auditor, uh, the department is subject to the audit of the CNAG, both independent, both separate, both standalone. And is that a cause of duplication? It's a cause of duplication, Chairman. It's, it's the way business is done and it's the way um, accounts are presented, and it's the way business cases are assessed. Um, that's the system that we work to. It's not, we don't have particular problems with it, but it, we have to justify our decisions, and it's not a matter of getting a blank cheque from the department and going away and building houses. Um, we, we cannot do that. Uh, we have to have approval, and indeed the department would have to satisfy um, the, the, their, parent, their finance department as well in relation to uh, agreeing uh, costs. Sorry, Chair. Just, just very briefly, um, just listening to the discussion and the concerns about the delay in the approval process, I think at the heart of this is an understandable concern on the part of the deputies about when will houses come on stream. Um, to bear in mind that, Sarah, as Sarah said, 18 months is the total length of time for the process. However, the announcements that were made uh, this time last year by Minister Kelly were, represented stage one approval for over three and a half thousand social housing projects. And there were other uh, smaller numbers of social housing projects that had been approved in 2014 under Minister Jan O'Sullivan. And just to give you some hope, we have been in the process, we're in the process of collecting information from local authorities now about live projects and what's happening. And the figures that we have is that um, uh, by the end of this year, on 74 projects, a total of 1,300 units will be started. There will be construction starting on site for that number of, of, of uh, projects. And in 2017, construction will start on site for 1,900 additional units. So um, we will also have a smaller number, a couple of hundred of social housing units completed, but they will be units that were approved in 2014. So the, the large numbers of units that were approved in 2015 are starting on site, a, a, a lot of them this year, and more of them by the end of next year. So that they are happening, the process is, 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 is going through. So, no, just bear, I, I need to get a number of other replies, and I will come back to you, Mr. Cummins. Uh, on Keegan, to yeah. come in, uh, just, Chairman. Just very briefly, first of all, I'd like to assure members that there's a huge enthusiasm among local authorities 
to rebuild or to build social housing. So uh, we were out of that market, not of our choice for a number of years. We're back in that market uh, and we're very enthused to be and delighted to be back in it. In our own particular case, we have a target under the social housing strategy to deliver 3,300 units. Uh, we will far exceed that target. And in fairness, put the full support of the department. Um, as more funds become available for social housing, we have a huge list of potential schemes that we will be forwarding to get approval. And these are not just infill schemes, there are a lot of big schemes as well. In relation to the process, I mean, concerns have been expressed about delay, and that's very understandable. But like, some of the things that we have done, with, again with the support of the department, we've used emergency planning powers to, to, to accelerate schemes. Uh, we've used uh, the accelerated restricted procedure, which is a shortened procurement procedure. We have piloted a uh, rapid build and we're about to pilot a uh, multi-storey rapid build. So um, in relation to the actual formal approval process, we very much welcome the initiative for the smaller schemes uh, and we hope to work with the department to get a, a truncated uh, approval process for the bigger schemes. Um, but, but there's a lot happening in that space. Uh, there was a question asked about, say, the, the our refusal of NAMUs and I'd just like to ask Dick to reply to that. This is for Dublin City Council, yes. specifically. Yeah, I suppose, I'll ask the others to follow up on their, yeah. account, their local authorities. I, I suppose the first thing is there's a figure of 6,000 units that gets quoted regularly. Uh, my understanding of that it would be significantly less than that. Some, somewhere in the order of 4,000 units uh, would be more, uh, more, to the, more to the point. Um, and um, I, I can't be more specific than that because the reason or the way in which the NAMI units were presented to us in the first place was, was, uh, was, was interesting because they were presented to us through the uh, housing, uh, housing agency and the housing agency signed a confidential, confidentiality agreement and the first round of offers were numbers plus general areas. Uh, and to which the local authorities went back uh, and replied in relation to numbers and general areas. We didn't get addresses in the, in, 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 in the initial phases of this. And we didn't get that because NAMA didn't own the properties. They were still uh, the, uh, belonging to the, the, the receivers. They owned the loans or whatever, but they didn't own the properties and they couldn't because of confidentiality, release names to third parties who... Uh, so until such time as they did deals with the, um, with the owners, we couldn't get addresses. Uh, and uh, that's why I say uh, I'm, I'm not too sure whether it's 6,000, uh, but it's certainly a lot less and I think it could be closer to... Uh, it could be closer to uh, 4,000. In relation to our own uh, position and the ones that the reasons why we, we refused uh, accommodation, um, I suppose the, you know the first reason was that there were tenants already in the in the uh, properties. Uh, the second thing uh, would have been that the uh, units themselves didn't meet construction standards. We were unhappy with the with the units. Uh, the third thing would have been that there may have been legal issues in relation to the. Uh, in relation to the, the properties. Uh, other ones, I suppose that the big one after the fourth round would have been that NAMA itself withdrew uh, properties. And in, in the City Council's case, they withdrew somewhere in the order of about 200 properties. Um, uh, so it's the next uh, thing in, in, in it, that these properties weren't being given to us gratis. Uh, so in other words, we had to uh, uh, pay for them, uh, whether that be by means of through the NARPs, through uh, leasing arrangements or to, to purchase. So they had to demonstrate uh, value for money. So in some instances they didn't uh, demonstrate value for money. Um, and I suppose there were other uh, reasons in relation to due diligence or that, that crept into the thing. So what I'm saying is that, I'm sorry, and the final thing then would have been in relation to high concentrations of um, Units already. So, in other words, we would have had uh, lots of units in in, uh, in areas already, and on, those, on that basis, we didn't take them. And that's in the policy context. You know, we're, we're now in 2016, looking back at something that started in 2011, etc., etc. So, the policy context that we were operating in at that stage, and, and to some degree still are. Uh, is in relation to the policy that that's, was set out in Building Homes, uh, Sustaining Communities, which deals with, as uh, Barbara Nikengas has already said, talks about uh, social sustainability, etc., etc., etc. 
So that would have been, they would have, would have been the main reasons that we uh, refused uh, units. I can say that though we, we accepted some units in all of the developments, uh, by and large, that we were offered. The representatives from the other local authorities on the NAMA and the other issues like to comment. Mr. Coleman. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chairman. Uh, I suppose I'll start with the with the, the, the properties that NAMA offered us. Um, for in the case of South Dublin, we were offered 591 units. Um, 507 of those are in one development, and it was a, quite a large development. Um, but there were issues. There were issues in terms of the construction of that, which subsequently cost in the order of 10 million. Um, to uh, repair and, and bring back into letable standard. Um, we were in debate with the developer prior to NAMA taking them over for a long time in terms of the finish. Um, came into uh, receivership. Um, we subsequently took 65 of those units which were effectively in two blocks. Um, and luckily we didn't take any before uh, the failure of the, the construction itself was found uh, to be um, defective. Um, and as you can see from that, 591 are offered, 507 in one development. We have uh, completed and are in the process of completing uh, 149. So the big difference was just that one development itself. Uh, in terms of, of uh, South Dublin, and I know the questions were asked by former colleagues, uh, I'll put it that way, um, and, and I'll bring it back to a local level in terms of South Dublin County Council and its plans. And it's just to state that, you know, in, in terms of, of completion of builds, in the next couple of weeks we'll have 15 units. We have 177 units uh, through a number of, of stages, particularly stage one, two, and the number through stage three. Uh, I have reported to Council and I have to say I have, I have had great support from the elected members in, in the Chamber in terms of the Part 8 projects I have brought to them. Um, there is another 280 which have been scheduled uh, over the next couple of months. Um, in addition to that, I do have to mention the Clonboris SDZ, um, which is going to, in the region of eight to 10,000 units are going to be there. Not all social, that's not all, but that's in total development itself. Uh, and there'll be quite a number of those will be for social housing use. In terms of the public-private partnership, there is part of the first 500 bundle, um, working with the NDFA and the NTMA, there's going to be 100 units. Uh, and there is, uh, Deputy O'Brien, as you mentioned, the Grange. Um, that's where the 100 units are going to be as part of that. However, we are working and we hope to finalise in the next couple of months a master plan for the development of the rest of that site. Uh, and that should provide in the region 750 to 850 units, and that will be a mixed development. And a number of those will be social housing units. But it will be a mix. And part of that mix is going to be the affordable rental. Uh, and I know a number of the deputies did mention there are a cohort there that are earning too much to be on the social housing list but are not earning enough to be in the private market. They have to be catered for and we hope to cater for those uh, within the master plan for the Grange itself. We mustn't lose sight. Uh, in addition, um, we are plans for 80 to 100 units. Uh, this will be more step-down accommodation, uh, effectively for uh, our, our elderly or old age, uh, to bring them back into a more safe community, closer to services and closer to facilities, uh, and will be effectively a step-down. And there are three projects that we're, we're, we're in the process of planning there. Part five, part five plays a role and it has done for a number of years. We've already uh, committed to 33 units, it sounds very little, um, but there's another 113 that we hope at the, during 2016 and 2017 uh, that we have, hope to get in there. And the approved housing bodies, um, I know I, I think it's fair to say that local authorities are only part of the solution. There are a number of solutions to the process and to this crisis that we're in at the moment, and we need to close off the circle. And you have the public sector, the private sector, and everything must come together. Uh, and there are uh, a number of things that have to be brought in to close off that circle, but they must come in together. Um, in terms of other plans with the approved housing bodies, there's 162 provided to date in terms of CAF, P and A that we have supported and CAS. Uh, and there are a number of other projects that we're working with approved housing bodies and will be 
uh, through the now agreed protocol, and this is for the Dublin region itself, the now agreed protocol of, of cooperation, collaboration and communication between approved housing bodies and local authorities. And I know, Deputy uh, Dowd, you, you've had your views, you have your views about approved housing bodies, but to be quite honest, in my own personal experience, I found they have very much come to the mark. The other Deputy Durkin. I'll withdraw that remark. I might have like but you'll escape the wrath of that you're lucky he's not here. Yeah. You're lucky, really. yeah. No, I got it the last day, so I know what I was facing. <laughs> I waited till he was gone. Um, uh, just to go on, you know, and I, I think we have to work very closely with them because they have to wear it all to, to get into the private financing market uh, to produce the social housing units. And just to say that nominations for approved housing bodies do come from, from the local authorities. 100% they do come from the local authorities and there's no intention to change that in any way. I do have to mention there's a lot of talk about the capital side and there is the revenue side and the revenue options that are open to local authorities and for South Dublin alone 1,017 cases were dealt with in 2015. And that, we can't lose sight of that. When we talk about homelessness, you're talking about putting roofs over people's heads. That is the crisis. 1,017, through the various revenue options that have been opened, were, were effectively uh, catered for in that year. Um, and we have the acquisitions. Uh, 33 were completed in 2015. Uh, we've, we're already close to completing 42 already this year. Our target is 70, and I do expect that we will exceed that target. They may say it sounds like small figures, but when you put them all together, it, it can make a big difference, and particularly in terms of the SDZ, the future part files that will come our way, and that master plan for the Grange itself. Um, in terms of uh, community needs and the infill, and I know it, it creates a lot of angst amongst communities, but the infill are going back into places, in some cases where there is elements of antisocial behaviour, and, and it can deal with that. But it's going back into to estates where huge, huge, huge investment uh, through the RAPID programme has gone into these areas over the years. And I think, you know, the deputies who are familiar with South Dublin will agree with me, with the amount of community facilities that we have there in terms of community centres, leisure facilities, we have horse projects, we have astroturfs, they are gone primarily into what has been called the disadvantaged areas. And, and that's dealing with the poverty element. But we're bringing infill back into an area where those facilities already are, and we'll help those facilities. And I would agree, and I think you, you took me up on it uh, the last time, Deputy Commenter, I was never a fan of the 5,000. You know, and I did identify... Sorry? the 5,000 incentivisation. Right, yeah. and, and, you know, I certainly um, I wasn't a fan of it then, not a fan of it now. I've seen the damage that it did do. And if we were to incentivise, and I won't use the word incentivise, if we were to kickstart, let's kickstart the private development. Let's kickstart that, because that is part of the solution as well. Uh, and I think we have to look at innovative ways of trying to make that happen again. In terms of build to lease, build to rent, uh, the part five we can gain from it, and maybe local authorities can play a role in, in, in doing that as well, along with the department. Uh, and I think, you know, to give that... To say as well, the collaboration and the working together with the department has improved, um, and I can say for South Dublin, a number of the stage approvals have come quicker, um, but we need to work much more closely together to make them come more quickly. Build takes time, and it's not going to happen in 12 months either. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Uh, Ms. Keenan, on behalf of Dunleary. Um, on behalf of Dunleary, just in terms of the NAMA housing offers, we were initially offered in the region of 300 possible properties, but like my colleagues, the eventual offer was in the region of, well, it was actually 190, of which 112 are completed contracted to date. And like the others, some properties were deemed unsuitable in terms of location, in terms of um, tenants already in situ, um, various different issues around those, but the majority of those 112 were taken up. Um, in terms of the units, um, uh, delivery of units, we are currently on site with 54 units, which will be built out by the end of the year. Another 140 are planned for 2017. 
We have 124 leasing through Part 5, which will be coming on stream in January 2017. We have eight Part 8s approved at the moment. Three are out to tender, and others are out preparation for tender. So we're working very closely with all those um, areas. We have... We're conscious, too, of the one-bed um, need, and we have a, a, a downsizing campaign currently underway with a high-class brochure we sent out to all our citizens, our elderly citizens, particularly living in uh, one-bed units. Um, we've got, they've come back. Um, we've got about 14 people who wish to downsize. Sounds small, but um, every bit helps in terms of getting families back into those properties. And um, we have 34 one-beds being refurbished at the moment. Um, and also we have 49 coming on stream. Um, and just in relation to the department approval process that has improved for us and um, we have no problems at the moment, we're working very well on those and uh, they're coming quickly on stream now. So, um, that's it. Th Thank you. And on behalf of Fingal, Ms Garrity. Um, firstly, in relation to um, the NAMA question, um, Fingal County Council were offered uh, 279 units um, initially from NAMA, um, of which 162 were subse subsequently withdrawn um, uh, by NAMA. Um, we confirmed availability uh, for a majority of the remaining units for 158. Um, units that we turned down uh, were specifically in one scheme, scheme where we already had a significant amount of social housing in that scheme across uh, various uh, delivery mechanisms um, and a scheme where the management fees on an annual basis ran into several thousand euro. Um, of the 158 for which we confirmed demand, at this point in time, 105 have been completed and are occupied, and the remainder are uh, under uh, completion. Um, Fingal's uh, targets under the social housing strategy from 2015 to 17 was 1,376 um, properties with a funding uh, envelope of 81 million. Um, to date, under the strategy, we have delivered uh, 522 um, social housing units, and within that, we've actually just completed um, and uh, two of our own direct uh, build construction schemes, one which we have just tenanted and one which we will have uh, occupied by the end of June. We have approved or agreed um, with the department and uh, through various other initiatives a further 668 um, properties. Um, so in terms of reaching our target at this point in time, we're in excess of halfway on that. Um, we also, subject to um, uh, funding being available to us, have examined all the various uh, mechanisms of delivery, um, both from private developments where Part 5 will apply um, with um, the affordable housing bodies and under the various leasing schemes. And we do believe that we can um, stretch that target to closer to 2,000 units over the duration of the three years um, we're funding to be available. Um, what we, uh, our delivery mechanisms, we ha if we wanted to break it down, what Fingal is doing itself in, uh, around construction and acquisition represents about a third of our targets. Um, another third of the target is largely uh, made up of um, our collaboration with the various affordable housing bodies, and then there would be um, direct engagement with um, private landlords, um, with RAS properties, and uh, with developers who might be uh, offering us um, opportunities uh, to purchase. Um, to date, we've brought nine uh, projects through the Part 8 planning process. One of those is a rapid build um, project which um, our councillors um, approved um, in, uh, last month. We have eight further projects uh, to bring uh, to the Council during um, 2015, um, including four rapid build um, schemes. Um, in addition to that, um, and it will extend beyond um, the, the, for the, this initial three years of the strategy, we have a number of uh, 
sites that are in our ownership um, that do require um, infrastructure um, that, would, that we plan to do ma uh, start the process of preparing master plans on those sites uh, during this year with a view to be able to uh, bring developments on stream um, at a number of other locations. Um, there are remediation works required, there are some road improvements um, or road access needed with some of these schemes and some um, uh, upgrades of existing infrastructure. The majority um, where we're doing master plans these are on sites that um, are bigger and we would see these as delivering um, mixed uh, tenure developments again we would be looking at collaboration with um, our affordable housing bodies in relation to that we'd be looking at a mixture of social housing um, affordable rental some private that uh, some senior citizens um, development also um, within Fingal we have a very young um, and rapidly growing population population but we also have on the other side an ageing population and uh, analysis at, uh, you know, um, suggests that a senior citizens programme and support to, do, to bring that forward and develop that would allow us to free up underutilised stock in that we do have um, quite a bit of underutilised stock currently uh, because of the absence maybe of choices for people to downsize and move on so that's something um, that we're looking at 